The original five-volume Devilman manga penned by Go Nagai in 1972 is one of my favorite stories. Broadly, it's a showcase of mass human indecency, a meditation on how the bestial hearts of men lead us to acts of evil. It's about demons from hell corrupting human souls from the inside by merging into them and making them act upon their most primal and thoughtless urges. It takes this darkness as far as it can, with an uncompromising and utterly bleak apocalyptic arc that so definitely captures the imagery and apocrypha of religious scale Ragnarok as to inspire endless future creators, and to stand in at least my memory as THE shorthand reference for such a representation. Put simply, Devilman's existence to me is a necessary consequence of recognizing the world and its history. Its message is that we live in such a fucked world that it would inspire someone to create Devil Man, something so harsh and bleak and downright cruel as to be a sobering reminder of just how shit people can be. Beyond that, it's got pretty sick monster designs and no shortage of badass memorable deaths, and the gleeful abandon of an author who's committed to being as edgy as he possibly can get away with. Devil Man is, after all, a shonen manga, somehow. Certainly one more terrifying for your mom to catch you with than any Manson album or Doom game. Without Devil Man, you would have no Eclipse scene from Brazil. Zerk, no Unit 01 ravishing a fallen angel, or half of what happens in the end of Evangelion. You definitely wouldn't have Kiryu in Ragyo or Senketsu from Kill La Kill, or Suda 5-1's grimdark sense of humor. Devils would probably still never cry instead of maybe crying, and personally I would credit every brutal, transforming manga anti-hero from Giver to the Soul Taker to Devilman's influence. In the late 80s, Devilman almost received a perfect adaptation in the form of an OVA series covering one volume per episode. While it took welcome liberties with the source material, and in places could have taken a few more, it was a mostly faithful adaptation with an utterly incredible visual presentation. Animation was on point, colors were phenomenally chosen, nearly every shot was cool or inventive in some way, and it captured the heavy metal aesthetic of the source material perfectly. It was too good to last, of course, with expensive OVAs going the way of the dinosaur in the Japanese economic crash of the 90s, and since it never got to what is far and away the best thing about Devilman, the ending, it can't even be recommended unless you've already read the manga. 2018's Devilman Crybaby is not the first attempt to recreate the original story with a different slant. I won't go into too much detail on the franchise history because Hyperbit Hero already did that in a fantastic video which I'll link below and at the end of this video. However, it is the most aesthetically diverse Divergent. Director Masaaki Yuasa brings the gloopy, abstracted visual style that he's known for, but nonetheless creates an excellent Devilman story by using this style to generate most of the same emotions that the original did just as powerfully as ever before. For those who love Devilman because it looks like a Metallica album cover fighting an Iron Maiden album cover, Crybaby may be a disappointment, with its soundtrack of weird dance music and cyberpunk synth throwbacks which I wouldn't be surprised to learn were inspired by Perturbator's work on Hotline Miami, which indeed may be closer to the drug-tinged, manic, and ultra-fast-paced violence of this Netflix series. If you love Devilman for the terrible physical sensation that comes from watching humans transform into monsters and then devour each other for minutes on end, then Crybaby will do you wonders. You also make some necessary changes in modernizing and maturing the source material. The manga's midsection of episodic demon fighting is truncated significantly, and the contexts of many situations are changed to lend them more emotional gravity. Instead of old school anime designs, we have these abstracted, unsexy designs which really come to life in the way that they're animated. Without exaggeration, Devilman Crybaby contains some of the most erotic key animation that I've ever seen, thanks to its dedication to realism in motion despite the abstraction of the artwork. Likewise, while demon designs may seem cartoonish when standing still, the ways that they move and the snappiness of their carnage will leave you feeling shook. While most of the childishness and shonen tropes of the original have been altered, Yuasa nonetheless keeps the manga's clusterfuck of tonality alive in his own unique ways. Not only have classic high school hoodlums been replaced with a gang of rappers, but they break into amazingly legit beatbox and rap jams every time they walk on scene. Exaggerated and goofy parts will lower the viewer's guard right before the series snaps into violent terror. And while I'm sure that some audiences will have more difficulty taking the show seriously because of these tonal shifts, the animation is so effective at evoking ferocity that it will doubtless churn the stomachs of all but the staunchest gorehounds. 
Amazing as Crybaby can look in its best scenes, however, it is very inconsistent, and definitely less complete than some of US's previous work. I'll put a link to a tweet chain by my friend Econ discussing how the series fails to live up to Yuasa's pedigree below, but the long and short of it is that too many scenes are left creatively untouched. Sometimes a background shot lingers for too long, or too much dialogue comes from characters awkwardly standing around looking janky, or there just isn't much going on at all. Reused footage is in abundance, and very nearly tarnishes the incredible key animation of the first episode through overexposure, and casting the scenes that it plays against into the shadows of what was accomplished there. One the climactic scene in the second to last episode is so awkward and bad that it single-handedly guaranteed I could not give the show the 10 out of 10 that I had wanted to in the first half. This isn't to say that the series is ugly on average. Even relatively inactive scenes are spiced up with small, unique details, like the lights on Ryo's car moving to the rhythm of the soundtrack, or the row of potted plants that have their own sunroof in Miki's house. Yuasa crafts some truly unique action scenes, and stuff that's so weird and off-putting that I'm not sure if it's hilarious or creepy or just bad. Then the animation kicks in and it sands my dick to a stump! Crybaby puts more work into its characters in the original story, so let's talk about them. Akira Fudo is a crybaby pushover who wishes he was a badass, and becomes one when his best friend Ryo causes him to be possessed by the demon Amon. With his incredible force of will, Akira manages to fuse with Amon instead of being overtaken by him, creating a devil man, an unholy altered beast of human empathy and demonic urges to constantly fucking kill. He can just barely contain himself not to rape his friends or to beat the shit out out of people for no reason, but at the end of the day, he's still sort of a good guy and kind of trying to save the world, so he's still the hero. Where Devilman shines as an anti-hero is in his struggle for control. What Amon lusts for are merely things which humans instinctively crave, but have taught ourselves to repress and keep under control. Devilman is not a hero because he unlocks his demonic power and kills all the bad guys, he's a hero because he doesn't turn that power against the innocent or the weak, even though he easily could. But for the most part, Devilman is hardly a morally steadfast monster. Sure, he only kills the bad guys, but he clearly enjoys doing it, and he even rapes one of them just for the sake of getting a nut before killing her. And while we know that Serene is an evil demon, and retroactively that she was in love with Amon and fully wanted his dick anyways, we still have to take a step back and ask ourselves what it says about us to be in any way gratified by the actions of a literal demon rapist. Unique to this version of the story is the crybaby aspect. While it's always been a defining characteristic of Devilman that he can empathize with both demons and humans alike, this version of the character is, well, a crybaby about it. What this amounts to is that in this version of the story, most of the demons whom Akira fights are either mutated from his friends and family in some way, or he is generally sympathetic to their emotional plights. This was obviously used as a way to keep all of the iconic monster designs and battles in the show while giving them a more relatable emotional context than just a cool demon to get torn apart part by Devilman. Unfortunately, the series doesn't do enough to endear viewers to most of these characters for their deaths to have any impact, and instead I felt it mostly served as a kind of diversion that waters down the raw brutality of the original story. You could argue that giving the characters more presence makes it so their deaths have even more weight, but I think that the strength of Devilman has always been its quick, visceral, and cutthroat brutality that communicates instantly, including in this version of the show. Suffice it to say that my heart was racing far more in the phenomenally executed forays of chaotic carnage than it was in any part where Akira cried over having to kill someone that we barely know. Two characters very nearly approach a dose of intrigue, but are hardly capitalized on. In spite of being built up in the background for most of the show, one of these characters has an arc that just kind of spirals off in random directions without a clear through line and never reaches an interesting conclusion. The other, Miko, is probably the most fleshed out character in the show, as far as having clear motivations, emotional problems, and an arc that kind of makes sense, when light but obvious spoilers incoming, she turns into a devil man and embodies the worst characteristics of her personality which she has tried to suppress, and in so doing becomes a badass athletic superstar. This character is taken in some weird directions sometimes, but at least receives a satisfying conclusion to her arc. Arguably Ryo does as well, and apparently Masaaki Yuasa sort of considered him the main character, but probably should have put a lot more emphasis on that throughout the show. With his complex schemes and social media manipulation, Ryo is turned into more of a modern Kira-esque villain, whose arc is mostly about learning to understand himself. A lot of the development of this arc is backloaded into the final episode though, at a point in the narrative where it's nearly impossible to care about, so I would say that the ball would appear to have been fumbled on whatever this character was supposed to make us feel. Even the 
arc of Devilman himself is at least a little strange. When he starts trying to protect the other Devilmen, it sorta comes out of nowhere without much explanation. There is something interesting, though, about the duality of the Devilmen, allowing them a moderate perspective on the humans versus demons conflict, and an understanding that it isn't impossible for all of them to coexist. Their voice is too small, of course, and the pandemonium of war quickly overtakes them, leading to the story's iconic final stretch. But in the context of the actual narrative, the individual motivations of the Devilmen are a bit unclear. Bear in mind, these are not overly significant detriments to the quality of the series as a whole. Devilman is primarily famous for its iconography, atmosphere, and apocalyptic ending, not for its characterization. I only broke all this down to explain how the retooled focus on characterization over demon battles hasn't really changed this. While it is arguably a more compelling story, and unquestionably a much tighter one, the appeal has not changed, and the parts that work are more or less the same as they always were. If there's anything I can actually charge Devilman Crybaby with as a crime, it is only the ways that it botches the pacing of its ending, leaving way less of an impact, at least on me, than the original did. Without diving too much into spoilers, the problems begin with a badly acted scene at the end of episode 8, during which American-born but obviously not American native actor Ayumu Murase utterly botches Ryo's big heel turn speech with his abysmal English delivery. Now don't get me wrong, Murase's performance is mostly fine. He was obviously chosen for his ability to do both masculine and feminine voices, as previously displayed playing Rui from Gatchaman Crowds, and for being able to pronounce English words better than most Japanese actors, but not well enough to actually convince an American audience. I find it upsetting that Netflix didn't recognize how terrible this take was and tried to do something about it before the series went to air. I can only assume they were more concerned with the English dub, which thanks to typical dub casting and leaving the amazing rap sequences completely untranslated is measurably worse than the Japanese audio. I'm really disappointed that Netflix didn't hire an American rapper to rewrite and perform the raps. This would not have been difficult. Cartoon Network gets rappers on their shows all the time, and I'm sure there's a few guys who would have been stoked to show up in a violent-ass Devilman anime. Anyways, there's more to say about the ending, but we'll save that for spoiler talk at the end. My favorite thing about this Devilman incarnation is how the team has taken advantage of what Netflix would let them show, as well as the knowledge that they are creating for an international audience in 2018. Scenes of demons toying with the fear in human hearts have been made topical, as in this scene wherein an innocent kid is nearly shot by a cop over a misunderstanding. This isn't the kind of social commentary that you see much in Japanese media, because it's not something that's a hot-button issue in Japan, but you definitely see it on Netflix, and that's because it's a big deal elsewhere. Yuasa ensures that his Devilman is no less edgy than ever before, going out of his way to trigger the sensibilities of different audiences. We get to see a gay male buttfuck, which you'd never see on Japanese TV, as well as what could be described as an heroic rape scene, which you'd never see on American TV. Edge aside, in this version, Miki's father is a white Christian, making her one of the only mixed-race anime heroes who isn't that way just as an excuse for blonde hair. There's a lot of multilingual dialogue, and while this can have dire consequences, certain scenes use it to chilling effect, like when Ryo's father transitions from English to spooky, affected Latin in the first episode. At the intersection of all this internationalism and modernization is a shot of the man who probably made it possible for a show about the apocalypse to be greenlit by Netflix for ten whole episodes. No, but seriously, there was no better time for Devilman to take another stab at popping into a American pop culture that at a time where the most talked about show on TV is the most violent thing to reach that level of cultural relevance since the Roman gladiatorial arenas, and a significant portion of the population is legitimately more afraid of our leader causing the end of the world than they ever were of 2012 doing it. Partnering with Netflix will no doubt continue to open new possibilities for the funding and distribution of anime, and if they can market this thing right and capitalize on the hype surrounding it, then it could be a huge win for internet original anime productions. Masaaki Yuasa clearly cares a hell of a lot about advancing not only the art form of animation, but how it is funded and consumed, and if he can start a trend of anime being released in the vastly superior marathon format, then he will be my personal hero. Anyways, I've told you all the really important things about Devilman Crybaby, but I still have to make some pedantic complaints about the ending before I conclude this video, so let's dive into spoiler talk. I know I'm not usually one to make a whole to-do about spoilers, but since a significant part of Devilman's impact is in its shock value, I would strongly encourage you to either read the manga or watch the Netflix show to completion before continuing. 
Across episodes 9 and 10, the pacing of Devilman Crybaby gets really strange. It begins with easily the worst scene in the show, not only for reusing footage like crazy, but particularly hideous shots at that. And its weird, preachy tone is totally incongruent with the general attitude of the series. Plus, it gets ridiculous when little kids come up to hug Devilman's legs, like what? The final episode is particularly confounding with its structure. In the original manga, scenes of the world being destroyed had preceded the death of Akira's loved ones, and after the infamously iconic shot of Miki's head on a pike, the manga pretty much barreled towards its climax, briefly showing us a chaotic world in its final death throes as Satan reveals their hermaphroditism and love for Akira before watching him die. Much of the power in this ending comes from how sudden, shocking, and iconic it is. There are only so many images left, but they are unforgettable, especially the final page. Crybaby jumbles these scenes in a really unsatisfying way. We for some reason get an exposition dump of info which would have come up way earlier in the manga and which isn't exactly relevant at this point in the story. In fact, some of it is stuff we would have had to infer just to follow the plot until now. A sequence of humanity's last stand drags on for too long without impact because the emotional apocalypse of the series has already transpired with Miki's death. That moment was meant to signify the inability for this story to end happily. At that point, the only thing left was to show us just how fucked things really got and to wrap up the last few plot threads before piecing out. Instead, the last episode takes time to explore the history of Ryo and Akira's friendship and then to conclude Ryo's emotional arc, even though we haven't seen enough of him over the course of the show for it to have much impact, and the story is quite obviously already over at this point. It's a clumsy way to wrap things up, and it's particularly upsetting because I can only imagine they did this so that Miki's death could be a big end of episode twist, which was unnecessary because the show was released all at once and will most likely be watched almost exclusively via marathon. It would have made much more sense for episodes 9 and 10 to have been combined into one 35 minute finale, which could have tightened all these scenes up, rearranged them to make sense, and then hit us with the brutal series of rapid gut punches that the ending is supposed to be. Instead, there's an after credit scene in episode 9 that shows Miki riding on the back of Akira's motorcycle. Now this scene made my fiance cry so I could appreciate the argument that it was meant to turn the screw in even further, but to me it just felt like an attempt to alleviate the shock of watching the cute love interest die. Even the death itself is less shocking than the original. While Miki is much more present as a character in this adaptation, its attempt to pay respect to her only reduces her memorability. While the swelling music and her solemn dead face make sense as a dramatic way to send off a character, it was the sheer wrongness of a cutesy anime love interest severed head shoved in our faces that made made the original scene so iconic. I'm sure there could be a debate over whether the story is better with Miki being more of an actual character, but personally, I don't think she contributes anything more significant to the greatness of Devilman in her characterization than she had done by being killed, and so the death scene deserved to be as shocking as humanly imaginable. Having said that, I did see this coming as a fan of the original manga, so I'm sure that the impact would have been less for me either way, and I'm sure that for some viewers, this image will be just as burned into their retinas as the original is into mine. Anyways, that's all I've got on Devilman. Devilman Crybaby. In spite of my issues with it, I did enjoy the series a whole hell of a lot, and if anything can top it as my favorite anime of 2018, then I'll know we've had a really solid year of Japanese cartoons. I'm glad that it got me thinking about Devilman again, and even more glad that it spurned both the original manga and its most recent reincarnation to American releases this year, which would have been enough to justify its existence alone, to be quite honest. If you enjoyed this review, then consider supporting me on Patreon so I can make more like it, and be sure to check out more of my stuff 